Today, we begin with the virtual lecture in honor of Hispanic Latino Heritage Month. If you are a first time attendee, welcome. And we hope that you will want to return periodically. If you are returning after our short break to when we plan for our future, we thank you so much for your patience and for coming back. My name is Barbara Velasquez. It is my honor to serve as either your moderator or an assistant to an in-person virtual or hybrid programming over the next several months. The United States officially honors Hispanic Latino Heritage Month beginning on September 15th through October 15th, recognizing and celebrating contributions of Hispanic and Latino champions who trace their roots to Spain, Mexico, Central America, South America, and the Spanish speaking nations of the Caribbean. The timing is key, always starting on September 15th, a day that marks the anniversary of independence of five Latin American countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Mexico and Chile follow, celebrating their independence September 16th and 18th, respectively. Our 2023 Hispanic Latino Heritage Month theme is Latinos Driving Prosperity, Power, and Progress in America. Your microphones and chat with other audience members are turned off, but you may always contact the hosts. Send your questions via the chat at any time to moderator Barbara Velasquez. Watch in the chat for a link to an online evaluation of today's program. We are beginning a year with over 50 opportunities to participate. Those who attend at least 10 programs and complete the online evaluations during 2023, that would be September through, through December, and add your contact information will be recognized. So with no further ado, Isaias Hernandez was born in Los Angeles, California, also known as Tongvaland. He grew up in Section 8 housing, was a recipient of food stamps, and lived in a community that faced environmental injustice. These firsthand experiences are where he'd eventually find his passion for the environment, social justice, and equity. As Isaias witnessed the ways pollution affected his body and community, he turned his anger and sadness into a solution, creating environmental education that would prioritize accessibility and intersectionality. Isaias earned his BS in environmental science at the University of California, Berkeley, and began gaining experience in diversity inclusion work in environmental spaces, academic research, and creative work. He has interviewed Vice President Kamala Harris and was featured on the digital cover of Vogue with Billy Ellish on the Harvard Sea Change Program as Climate Creators 2023 Program. Now Isaias seeks to help everyone educate themselves on the intersectional nature of the climate crisis. He believes a diversity of worldviews, backgrounds, and experiences are essential to achieve success in the environmental movement. The climate crisis is an educational crisis and forms of education that can be sustained outside of our institutions will help to address it. He wants to help create a world where low-income students no longer struggle to learn about environmentalism, and this desire led him to create his platform, QueerBrownVegan.com. Since then, he's gotten to see firsthand how independent communicators can connect the corporate and nonprofit sectors, change minds, and inspire all generations. Isaias is currently living in Los Angeles, working as a full-time content creator for Queer Brown Vegan, a public speaker and a consultant. In his free time, he enjoys reading, cooking, foraging, and connecting to ecological wealth. Please welcome Isaias Hernandez, who will present Latinos and the Environment. Great. Um, thank you so much again, Barbara, for that. And I'm so sorry, everyone. I had some Wi-Fi issues, but now I'm connected to my data, so there shouldn't be um, any issues on that. And I am super thankful to be speaking with you all. Um, this is a very open conversation around some of the work that I've done, but also hopefully it kind of brings um, to the forefront some of the conversations that are often missed in dominant environmental conversations. So um, yeah, to get started, I'm just going to start getting my slides ready um, on that end and probably hide this away so people can actually uh, pay attention more to it. But yeah, so I think a little bit about this topic is just really exploring Latinx communities with environmental 
environmental histories and how we really talk about um, ecologies of collapse during this time of the climate crisis and how do we find ourselves um, as environmentalists of color and specifically through our Latin lens, what it meant to me to really do this work as an environmentalist. Um, so to kind of get started, um, when people ask me like who you are, um, I usually say, you know, I'm someone that grew up in Los Angeles. So uh, my parents are originally from Mexico. Um, my mother grew up in um, a place called um, San Miguel. Um, and my dad grew up in Mexico City. And I grew up here in Los Angeles with two of my siblings. I'm actually the youngest. And it's very fun fact, um, me and my sister have the same birthday or four years apart. And one of the things that I really experienced as a young kid was realizing the gravity of what it meant to be an environmentalist of color. Um, I grew up in extreme poverty and I'm so thankful for my parents today for, for you know, never having to face any instances of being houseless, but um, that really inspired a lot of the work I do today because as someone that grew up in an environment that really lacked environmental resources and equity, um, that really gave me that curiosity to ask questions about people. And Queer Round Vegan today is really a grassroots media pl platform that really covers a variety of issues and how they intersect. Um, it's really funny because I think when people ask me about this social media influencer account, um, I usually tell people like the intent wasn't really so much to really grow social media following was more geared towards just understanding like how can we talk about environmentalism, but it was also geared towards my identity. Um, I was just really exhausted having to not having to really not talk about quote unquote race when we know environmentalism is a political issue. I was really tired of just like not of having to hide some of my queer identity and thinking that, you know, I shouldn't even be talking about sexuality or gender, when in fact we know that, you know, there's so many queer and trans environmentalists who have done environment work. And then my veganism kind of came later in life as not so much an identity, but more of a value-oriented mindset of, you know, other ways that I wanted to really take action from my individual lens as someone that grew up here in the global north. And so I really, um, really struggled to really understand who I was as a really young environmentalist. Um, as mentioned kind of previously, um, my mom really messed up my bangs on this photo, so I'd never forgive her. Um, I always tell my friends that like to to not look at this photo because it's really embarrassing. But, you know, um, as a young kid, I really I realized that um, we grew up in poverty. I know my parents were really ingrained with this idea of having to use everything you had. My mother really knew how to sew. She would help me upcycle a lot of my clothes or really recycle certain parts of fabrics into use to cleaning. Um, and my dad was a very much a hard worker. He's a gardener himself. And, um, you know, when I was a teenager, and this is, we'll probably briefly talk about it, is that I started working at the age of 13, 14 on the weekends with my older brother and then myself and my dad. Um, we'd go around LA and start to garden rich people's homes that were predominantly white. And I started to recognize like there was a lot of environmental differences of how can you live in LA and realize the massive amount of luxury and wealth that exists in one city, but then go two cities down and it's extreme poverty. And so I, I started to really recognize that, oh, okay, so there's some type of like idea of inequities that exist here or what I would say like you know why is it that these communities are currently suffering um I I really realized that in an early age that my discovery for environmentalism also came from a lot of mixed emotions um I grew up a lot watching um how we would say like free cable tv or affordable cable tv because I couldn't afford Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon and I'm very thankful to be able to watch shows like PBS, Nat Geo, um, Discovery Channel. And I started to realize that um, I really love to watch nature shows. It was really my gateway and almost um, connection to really being able to feel at calm with nature documentaries. I found them very at ease. And it also inspired me to feel like, wow, people get to travel the world. Like they're experts, they're scientists. Um, they're all They're all learning about this. Um, and I would look at myself sometimes and really felt a really hard time to identify myself with the word environmentalist because um, typically that was, you know, really shown in environmental shows or documentaries was 
often like very luscious gardens filled with forests, filled with water, clean air. Um, and the question became like, do I love or hate my environment? And I really struggled with this idea of like, my environment did not look like so many of the TV shows. Um, as mentioned before, like, you know, in my apartment complex building, I remember trying to plant this very small garden because there was a very small plot of soil that existed. And I remember I grew this like really nice flower that took like, obviously like it took months and it didn't take weeks. And I remember that as soon as the flowers came out, my, the management um, took out the flowers and said that we couldn't have any, you know, anything there. And I kind of saw that as a moment of like, you know, how am I supposed to feel connected to these landscapes when pavement is all over um, where I was living? And so one of the things I always tell people about my identity as a Latino is that like, and this is shared with many cultures right there, is that um, my parents would take me a lot to La Segunda. Um, and for those who speak Spanish, La Segunda or English, um, it's basically like a secondhand store, thrift store. Um, and I never really saw it as sustainable. I just saw it as being in poverty. Um, and I, I think for a lot of, there's a lot of misconceptions that poor people specifically don't have any um, sustainability or interest in environmentalism when in fact they actually do have a lot of practices that were forced upon them that made them survive that way and also operate in a way that's mindful. Um, and it seemed like to me, the more and more I delved into these privileges about environmentalism, I said that, you know, having access to clean air, water or soil um, seemed like a kind of like a rich thing to do on that end. Um, and so this is a picture of me, I think in like middle school or high school, I was still trying to figure myself out of like, what is it that I wanted to do? And I know that many of you here today are probably in community college, really struggling or trying to identify like, what is the career that you really want to focus on? And, you know, for me, I, I always tell people when I look back is that um, I struggled my entire life, um, maybe even like, I'll get more into it, even in college to recognize that I don't really see myself as an environmental expert. I don't see myself a leader in this expert. Um, in fact, you know, whenever I would watch these TV media shows, it was never um, black or brown people of color. It was usually white cis men. And I think when people tell me like, you know, well, you're hating on, you know, certain groups or like white men, it's like, it's to say that the whole media and entertainment industry itself is so is lacking so much diversity today. Yes, there's active strives to change that. Yes, there's more shows uh, with black and brown POC hosts, but that was something that I really felt um, struggled with is that I didn't know anyone in my community that was doing environmental work in the sense that it looked like what was being shown on TV and media. And so it wasn't until actually in high school and senior year, I went to this presentation and um, one of the presenters said like, did you know that 60% of your health comes from environmental factors and 30% comes from, um, I believe around 30% comes from genetics. So the idea that many of the people in my community that were predominantly black and brown, having high rates of asthma, living nearby toxic facilities, living nearby heavy freeways or trainways like the Metrolink in LA, um, these were all actually incidences that were perpetuated by systemic racism. So in my earlier years as, as a kid, I would say that, you know, I was able to say like, oh, the government's corrupt, but you know, how is it corrupt, right? What is it that's not being evenly designed? What are the policies and practices that are going in that are not making things as equitable? And so I, I think for me, when I realized about the term environmental justice, it really related to me as someone that says, wow, like this is what I've been experiencing this whole life an environmental injustice and in my entire life growing up poor, I said, well, my parents didn't work hard in life. Therefore, we deserve to live in an environment like this. And I couldn't stop to think that as I've gotten older, like how many poor kids probably think the same way as me of like, you know, oh, well, you know, my parents want the American dream. They glorify this idea of making it so successful in America. And I really try to deter from those narratives um, at such an early age because I started to think, well, you know, what am I really trying to achieve in a society that is not ecologically well, right? So the idea from generational wealth to ecological wealth was something that I was very invested in. Um, and, you know, I, I had this question uh, throughout my head is like, 
okay, so I, I got good grades. Um, I always tell people that my, I think my average GPA out of high school was around like a 3.7. It was weighted, I, I believe. I don't remember. It was not a 4.0. I was never a 4.0 student. Um, fun fact, I always got C's in math classes um, until I realized like, you know, I should study more for math. But, you know, I, I had this idea that in order to be an environmentalist, I had to get a degree, right? I had this narrative of like, if you want to save the planet, you want to do really good work, you need to put yourself in university. And at the time, if you were to ask 17 year old or 18 year old me, do you think you need a degree to make yourself a better environmentalist or to be called an environmentalist? I would have said yes. I'm now 27. That's been almost like a decade. And I say, no, you don't, you don't really need that. But I, I think one of the experiences um, I had at my college, um, I, I, I went to school um, to UC Berkeley and studied environmental science, as mentioned before. Um, I had a really hard time struggling with learning about environmentalism. One of the reasons why I had such a hard time as a Latino to understand environmentalism is that it really denied intersectionality, but it also failed to include so many diverse voices of environmentalists. Um, we talked a lot about very famous environmental conservation heroes. Um, a really quick question I want to ask the audience, and you don't need to answer or say anything in the chat, is when you think of an environmentalist, what are the top three or four environmentalists you think of? Now, let's think there for like three seconds. If you thought about Greta Thunberg, Jane Goodall, David Attenborough, um, you know, Bill McKibben, other famous white environmentalists, why is it the fact that our minds are easily able to name these environmentalists? And if I asked you, can you name five black environmentalists? Can you name five indigenous environmentalists? Can you name five POC environmentalists? Our heads kind of scramble. Even at times, I will admit, there's times where I'm like, oh my God, like, yeah, I don't know more than five or, oh my God, I do know so many, but it's again, why is it the fact that in pop culture or in dominant cultures that we operate in environmentalism and what we study, why is it the fact that we don't humanize those stories? And one of the things that I really um, disliked in my environmental academic career is this glorification of environmental philosophers. Um, if you all know about John Muir, Aldo Leopold, very famous environmental philosophers. Yes, some, certain, certain of their phrases and statements are great of what they're saying in terms of like their writing style. But John Muir that um, was that created the Sierra Club, the nonprofit, um, was in fact racist and said very racist things about indigenous communities and called them dirty and primitive. These are all very harmful and um, anti-indigenous narratives that were being pushed out there. And yet we still were seeing the fact of glorifying these people as leaders, as heroes, when in fact we know that the, the indigenous communities that still, that still exist today were the ones that were tending the land and regenerating those landscapes. And so I really struggled with this idea of being like, okay, well, what are the Latino environmentalists? And I really struggled um, as a peer person of color to be in the research field in environmental science because I recognize that there's a lot of microaggressions that happen. So a really great example of this happened very easily when my professor um, told me, set me aside and wanted to talk to me about my paper and realized that um, you know, there was a few errors on on there. And he he mentioned to me like in the beginning, and this is like, I think I was 18 or 19 at the time. He says, you know, look, I know you grew up in Mexico and you're an immigrant and you're living here in America and it must be hard for you to adjust. And it was a very assumption of like, oh, well, he doesn't know. He like confused me for another student. But then he also, um, you know, mispronounced my name and just assumed that just because I had a poor writing section in a certain area, that I was deemed um, illiterate or not an American. And I think that was really a, a eye-opening experience for me because I was so young and I didn't know how to talk back. And I felt like, you know, we I allowed this um, racist professor and let's call it for what it is um, to perpetuate these harmful statements. And I can't imagine so many undergrads and like community college students who also stay silent due to the injustices that exist um, on that end. Um, I definitely would say that, you know, um, in my time trying to find community as a Latino environmentalist is, um, I got involved with an organization called Green Latinos, 
And they were really a great source for me um, during undergrad years because I really struggled to identify with what it meant to be an environmentalist, but also to really keep telling myself that I should stay as an environmental scientist. Um, I know that many of you probably have so many career choices out there. And I know that in my department, I had choices from chemical and en environmental engineering, uh, microbiology, society, and environment, conservation and resource studies. And I just really stuck to environmental science too, because it was a very holistic major for me that provided both the social, physical, um, biological, and um, you know, heavy science route to be able to learn. And I graduated um, within four years, which was really horrific. This is me and my mom actually celebrating the day I finally got my degree and really understood that, you know, I, I really had this um, notion of for me to succeed in undergrad is also to succeed for your family. Um, and I know that for my family, they've always ingrained into me the idea of environment, of education. Um, I really have this personal story where my mom um, was actually, she had just finished her educational degree in Mexico and was going to become a teacher when she decided to um, you know, immigrate to six, um, six months later into the United States. And I remember um, she had told me that she had worked herself, um, uh, you know, by herself multiple jobs. Um, her parents really weren't supportive of women going into higher education. And she paid for herself to go to college. And, um, you know, when she moved here, she was deemed quote unquote undocumented and, you know, was unable to obviously teach legally here in the United States. But one of the things I always say is like my mom was my teacher. She was also part of my life during that time. And I think, you know, I'm very grateful for um, everything she did to really get me to the next level of my career. Um, I think like learning both languages from Spanish and English was so powerful to be able to learn how to write and speak in Spanish at the same time. And so um, I think for many first generation immigrant kids, um, there is this double added pressure of when you're trying to survive in a field that's not already diverse, but then um, having to really not talk to your family about it, because there's always this thing with Latin culture is like, sometimes you don't want to talk about it, or you don't want to talk about some of your stress and your problems. But there was moments I just had those feelings of wanting to give up um, in academia. So when people tell me today, like the work I've been doing is like, what inspired me really to be a Latin environmentalist was witnessing social, racial, environmental injustices. To think that in America today, we are currently um, implementing educational models, such as, for example, in Florida, um, they're implementing certain models of education where they're comparing um, climate change activists to Nazis. Um, these are very horrific um, injustices that are currently happening in our systems, and it's getting worse. Um, and I think for myself, I am someone that, yes, is the truth seeker, but someone that seeks justice because there is no such thing as living in a safe planet or a secure world if we still allow racism, white supremacy, um, neocolonialism to continue to plunder our communities. And that is something that I really stand against. And so um, I teach people about environmental justice specifically because it looks into the fact that how race, class, and gender do heavily affect the communities. When people are asking me specifically about, you know, the environment can't be racist, um, nature is not racist. It's true. I, 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 nature is not racist. But do you want to know, in fact, what is racist? It's the people in the power who have implemented the policies and practices who are, in fact, racist. Um, a very common example of environmental racism, um, which looks specifically into the policies and practices, is redlining. So common examples in Los Angeles could actually be found when War World II veterans were returning um, from the war, and many banks and governmental programs promised all veterans a loan to buy their home. Now, during this time, um, a lot of veterans of color, specifically black and brown, um, you know, uh, black and brown veterans were coming back. Um, many, many white affluent communities were not happy with the idea that black and brown communities were trying to move into their neighborhoods. So they threatened to sue local city governments and told banks not to give loans to um, black and brown communities in those homes and instead to place them somewhere else. 
Um, and this is during, of course, you know, um, a lot of communities wanting to uphold this idea of segregation. And so the reason why we ask, well, why is it that this poor um, community is living in this toxic industry? It's because of environmental racism. And when people are trying to argue about what came first, the, the chicken or the egg, they're arguing from this idea of like, what came first, the fossil fuel industry or that poor brown community that came in first? It doesn't matter who came first. It's the fact that we are putting development projects that are extremely harmful and, and chemically destroying the genetics and bodies of our children and our future generations because of profit, because we don't see black and brown people of color, because we don't see Latin, Latin, Latin communities as um, we see them as disposable um, in this. And this is a very shared common goal for many communities in rural and urban areas that live in poverty. Um, and when people say, well, you know, that's not just possible, like, well, show me the data and research. In fact, you know, communities of color have higher exposure rates to air pollution than their white non-Hispanic counterparts. And that study found that, you know, 11 of 14 pollutants um, were found in exposure rates. And when we think about um, lead poisoning, right, um, a lot of lead poisoning was not regulated heavily back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and even 2000s where a lot of children of color are exposed to so much, um, you know, risk of lead poisoning for urban areas. And I remember like, you know, telling like, you know, a very interesting thing is like in my apartment building that was section eight owned, I remember they would always paint every like year. And I remember like my mom would always be like, you know, stop, don't smell the paint, like put a mask over your face. And I was like, why? She's like, because it's extremely toxic for your brain. And I remember as a young kid, I didn't really listen to her. I was just like, well, it's fine. And now it's like, I, you know, a very sad slash funny thing is like, I tell my friends like, oh my God, like sometimes I like the smell of paint, but then I'm like, I shouldn't be liking that small paint because it's very toxic. And so those are really examples of like, you know, um, things that we don't really know until later in life about the health extremities and outcomes on the end. Um, and to think about the ways of, of environmental injustices is looking at toxic sites. So as a Latin environmentalist that advocates for total liberation, I'm not just talking about urban and rural communities. I'm also advocating for people that are currently imprisoned by the prison industrial complex. Um, there was a research study done a few years ago. And it was an article that said that people who are imprisoned um, returned with around a 20, 30% health decline in their bodies. And a lot of that was found that they're either nearby coal plants, um, uh, toxic industries that are built on it and exposed to extreme heat. Um, if we look at immigration centers, it was found through Vice articles that some of the immigration centers that are imprisoning kids right now and mothers and, and parents and other people um, are literally killing these people because they're built on former military ground sites that are heavily polluted. And many of those immigrants come from Latin America. Um, and of course, let's not forget about our Afro-Latin um, communities and also um, those that are coming from Haiti that are currently being imprisoned here um, up in Tijuana and California. Um, and we have to also think deeper about immigration. One of the things that immigration uses um, isn't just fossil fuels and industrial agriculture. The third industry that is the most profitable that constantly plunders these communities is the border and surveillance industry. Um, there's been a lot of new technologies that are being developed right now as we speak that is being used as quote unquote national security that actually uses drones to hunt down immigrants and to map out where they're hiding. Um, these are very extreme um, dangerous tools that are being developed as we speak and have been used by um, ICE, that is also the immigration industrial complex that must be dismantled and collapsed. Um, we think about agriculture, right? The people who pick my food, the fruits and vegetables that I eat, comes from undocumented farm workers. Um, around a large percentage of California imports food locally, and that's something that um, we don't really recognize. In the fashion industry, a lot of people think sweatshops don't exist. You come to Los Angeles of certain states, sweatshops do still exist today, um, and they're exposed to harmful chemicals. In aquaculture, the fishery industry, right? We have to remember that whatever is picked in the land is also picked in the sea, and that's another huge issue that goes into immigrant rights. Um, 
And so, as mentioned before, environmental racism is kind of the concept for the environmental justice movement that highlights the specific policies and practices that discriminate against Black, Indigenous people of color. So when many citizens and many people want to sue the government, um, they have to prove an environmental injustice. In order to prove an environmental injustice, you need to ensure that there's a specific policies and practices that were implemented into those communities decades before that allowed for the continued operations of pollution. And these lawsuits take years and to even be heard in the court case and to be approved to the next case, it takes years on that end. Um, and yeah, to kind of really understand the history of the environmental movement and how it kind of relates to um, what we do is that during the 1960s and 70s, there was a huge uproar for the Earth Day and the idea of celebrating Earth. And um, it was found that it was heavily dominated by white middle class and it succeeded in building an impressive political base for environmental reform and regulatory belief. And so the reason why I say this specifically is that as someone who grew up um, in a low income neighborhood, I used to often hear that, oh, environmentalism is a white thing. Um, I even today hear it from my friends that came out of college that still think that my work as an environmentalist doesn't highlight immigration, doesn't highlight those who are working in the front lines it often tries to separate and you know that these communities are interconnected. Our crises are all connected under the umbrella of white supremacy that we are facing today. And environmental media is something that I saw that needed diversity. I saw that many famous ads, like if you look on the right side, and I don't know how many of you all saw this ad because you're maybe younger than me. I remember seeing this ad in an environmental college class. It's basically an ad that showed an indigenous man, quote unquote, indigenous man um, walking and he was in this river and he has his raft and he's crying, saying like people aren't picking up their plastic. It was found out that this man was not indigenous. Um, he's actually Italian and they just made him look brown. Um, and there was a lot of pictures that, that showcase that you know, you could see that, you know, where are the black and brown people of color? So can you imagine when I'm in middle school, high school, opening these books and thinking, OK, where, where's my people at? Where are the Latin people? Um, and that was something that was something that I felt needed to be highlighted. And so for me to give acknowledgement to environmental justice, I do want to give one of my um, acknowledgements to Hazel M. Johnson, who is the mother of the environmental justice movement, um, because we know that many Black and Indigenous communities um, coined these concepts and these terms and have contributed so much decades of research um, on that end. And, you know, I've been having the huge privilege to have learned from so much of these past grassroots activists who were able to prove um, environmental injustices on that end. Um, and of course, this is a picture of her when she met Al Gore. Unfortunately, she did pass away um, years ago, but her legacy continues to remain um, relevant in environmental spaces. Uh, and we're going to go to the father of the environmental justice movement, Dr. Robert Bullard. Um, and the reason why I quote him is that he really allowed me to showcase to other Latin communities of the, of the reason of why we need to start talking about environmental justice in br brown communities is because by like he said this very good quote that whether by conscious design or institutional neglect communities of color in urban ghettos in rural poverty pockets or in economically impoverished native american reservation america and during the civil rights movement when environmental justice started to being talked about more as you can see like um on that end like people were not really like highlighting or um, really talking about this. Instead, it was very focused on this conservation relief of save the bears, save the trees, but we're save the brown community, save the communities that are making most of the American economy in today's world. Um, and this is obviously a picture of me and him. I met him back in two years ago at a climate conference at COP26. It was very exciting. Um, but, you know, when I started to tap into Latin environmentalists, I, I, I found this plethora of so much idea of in Latin communities, we often try to, and let's be honest here, um, tend to ignore our Afro-Latin communities, our Asian Latin X communities, those who are mixed. Like, I think those are conversations that we're, we need to continuously have in the United States and also globally about how do we honor this diverse cultures of identities 
um, on that end. And I found about someone that was locally in my area as Aurora Castillo, who did so much work with, with mothers of East Los Angeles to ensure that there was communities, especially in Latin communities, um, had access to fight toxic waste and oil pipeline, also advocate for those who were in prison. Um, we don't often know about these narratives. We don't often know about these people because, again, these are people who have focused so much on grassroots local activism that a lot of their narratives have often been lost. Um, I know that we talk about Cesar Chavez. Um, when we when we think about Cesar Chavez, we usually try to group group him in the social justice migrant justice groups, but. Again, like social justice is racial justice and is environmental justice. Food is political. Food comes from the land. Food is grown from the environment. Therefore, food will always be used as a tool to nourish or oppress communities of color. Um, and he was someone that also, again, I grew up learning about. And in L.A., we celebrate. Um, I think you take a day off for school. It's called Cesar Chavez Day. And I'd always be like thankful because I'd be like, yes, I don't want to go to school. Um, but someone who I really met um, two years ago was Dolores Huerta, who was also fighting alongside with Cesar Chavez, um, who exposed the deepening reliance of pesticides and other chemicals that harm people. She has done so much effort in the environmental space, usually grouped within social justice spaces or immigrant spaces. But again, these were people that look like me, that had similar stories about facing injustices, and here they were. They they had never they had always existed and I felt so um, disappointed in myself that I didn't really do a better job when I was younger trying to find these people or trying to look up about Latin environmentalists um, on that end and we think about more like you know Francia Marquez who is the African Colombian activist but now VP um, of um, Colombia like she at Bastida like she's one of my good friends we think about Dr Carlos. Russell, like Afro-Latin activist, Berta Suniga, like a Latin American activist who um, her mother um, on the right side, you could see, was unalived due to trying to protect um, indigenous communities from the developments of hydrogram projects. And I, I, I really see this momentum for more Latin environmentalists to be able to share their story and their narratives and to really showcase um, who they are on the end. And one note to really kind of put away is that when we think about, well, why should Latinos care? Why should we as Latin people care about our people to be environmentalists? Is that Latin, like the reason why many of our communities moved to America, for example, you always hear the story of like, oh, we wanted better jobs. We wanted safety. In fact, you know that climate change is already plundering um, ecosystems. It was found that in Mexico, for example, where my parents are from, um, industrial agricultural and factory farms are already draining so much of the water supply, which that needs to stop because we shouldn't be using that much water on that end. And also, fun fact, Mexico City is literally built on top of a water reservoir or a lake. Like that was a very bad decision um, to even be made on that end. And so other countries like um, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Dominica, Dominica, Dominican Republic, uh, Republic, uh, Honduras, Nicaragua, like these are all other Latin American and also like um, Caribbean um, areas that are being heavily affected by the climate crisis. Um, they, we need to be able to address the extreme poverty that's affecting these new dimensions in the upcoming years if we want to adapt into climate strategies. Because the truth is that there's many countries, especially in like Latin America, that are asking for climate resilience funding, meaning that they are accepting that the climate crisis is here, that things are changing rapidly. And if there's no investment into the development of these projects, things can go haywire. And so one of the things I always tell people is that, you know, Latin communities, we, we build that international solidarity. Um, I never really um, knew about the amount of plethora of Latin American activists that now are in my social circles um, that I didn't know about years ago. And had I known more people of these folks um, that were in this space before, it would have been more of a safer um, outcome on my end to really navigate my, my world. And so I always tell people that, you know, you can't liberate our planetary crisis without our community. Um, I am someone that has recognized so much in the past years of my life and doing this work as a media creator is that collaboration is key. 
Um, collaboration is what's going to get you out there. Mentorship is what's going to get you to that next level um, of your career, but also to understand like, what is your role? Um, I think a lot of us do face imposter syndrome. And I know I can give you all tips about, you know, believe in yourself, write down your dreams. But the truth is like putting yourself into spaces and working creatively with people who want to build with you is going to allow you to have that sense of validation within your heart to know that this is what you want to do. And I know that if you still struggle to find that community, that's okay too. I mean, I struggled so many of my years to be able to understand what is the next thing I'm going to do. Um, and, you know, asking yourself a lot, um, people here today is like, what is your role in the environmental movement? Like, I'm not asking you all to study environment. I'm asking that if you're going into immigrant rights, if you're going into psychology, if you're going into fashion, food, business, how are you ensuring that there is an environmental or ecological component of your industry? Yes, I know that you know you're we're all trying to survive in this system that we're currently operating in, but do you also have a component to add ecological component? One of the things I always um, push with, um, push against with my other Latin friends, they talk a lot about the American dream, buying their parents a house, doing all these things. But I'm like, what are you sustaining in a in a dying planet? Generational wealth. We may we may lose those opportunities, and I know that it's not the people's fault or your fault or my fault. But we need to be able to start reframing those relationships to be able to have that cultural shift in our communities. Um, and that's why I do media work today is like, I really believe in having to work with people together. And, you know, my platform that was created back in 2019, I would have never really assumed that it would have, you know, taken off that much. But I also know that, you know, doing independent web series, hosting events now and being a consultant for different organizations, it's really given me um, plight and the honor to be able to continue doing this work on that end. And I just want to say, um, you know, thank you so much again for having me here specifically. I know that, um, you know, we had a little rough in the beginning, but I really want to take this time for you all to really start asking thinking questions um, on your end or other comments or other things that you'd like to ask me. I always tell young people here today is that it's always comfortable asking questions to me versus the professor because you're not going to get judged and there's no such thing as um, a stupid question here all right thank you so much um, if you as an audience member are sensing that there was a, that was a power packed uh, presentation with so much information that you could learn again I want to say that we're very thankful that Zayas is allowing us to record. Um, this is there will be a recording available for you to see um, at a later time, and um, it it'll be on Metro's YouTube page. But um, just watch at mccneb.edu/hispanic. Um, that recording will be up there also. So we're going to get started with some questions. Some great ones are coming in. I am a graduate student in an environmental philosophy program. Our program is extremely lacking in Latinx environmentalists and environmental justice altogether. Do you have any recommendations for Latinx environmental scholars that I could explore um, to learn more? Yeah, um, on my end, the reason why I'm looking down is that um, if you go on my Twitter at Queer Brown Vegan or at X now, I follow a bunch of environmental academic scholars that are not as big as they should be, um, and they deserve a platform. They're doing a lot of interesting research around climate adaptation. Um, and if you look at research studies about Latin America and climate change, you'll often find that there's many authors and scholars that are Latin that are writing about these stories. You can use um, Sci-Hub or Google Scholar to find those articles. Um, and to source them on that end. And then there is a there's a really great organization called Green Latinos um, and Green 2.0 that are both Latin operated that work a lot with Latin environmental leaders, experts, scientists, um, and they create community led events on that end if you're really interested in getting more involved in it. And then I think for the younger people out there, there's a group called Latinas for Climate 
um, Latinas for Climate um, celebrates um, Latin um, female climate activists, femmes, and non-binary folks um, in that space. And it's a very, really great space for other Latin American and also American um, Latin activists to get connected there. Thank you. Another question, as someone who mentors Latinx college students, how can I reframe environmentalism as a non-degree attaining pursuit and make it appealing to them when all they seem to be interested in is getting a degree that makes them money? I think this is the hardest component for many people, right? Um, I think, and this is something I talked a lot with a lot of my friends of color and they're Black, Asian, like we collectively talked and understood that um, for a lot of us, our parents expect us to give them a better life. And I had this very hard time understanding of what are my needs and what are their needs. And as an adult, I think I've gotten very comfortable to be able to know, like, I have to be able to balance both while also validating my needs. And I think for a lot of first gen immigrant kids, um, while their parents sacrifice so much for them, the kids are also sacrificing so much of their individuality. So a lot of them give up their dreams, a lot of them give up their passions, and a lot of them are like, well, I'll just go into business, or I'll go to medical school, or I'll go become a lawyer because I'm good at that material, but is it what I love? No. And I think we've been sold a lie in environmentalism that it's not a profitable career. I know that a lot of us here, like with the housing um, cost of rent and other things like that, is really hard. I mean, the first job out of college, it was really hard for me to get. In fact, I, I always tell this to people is that um, I actually didn't work an environmental job out of college. I got a job in New York City working at a fashion agency because I applied to all these environmental nonprofits like 350, Greenpeace, NRDC, and I got rejected. They told me I didn't have good work. And I, and I thought I did everything. I did research, I did environmental science. I came from a community that experienced environmental justice, but they just did, they didn't want me. And that's okay. And they're really great organizations. I think for a lot of young people today is that there are a lot of climate careers that exist today. Um, one of those great resources is called the Green Jobs Board that is run by my best friend that connects young um, climate um, creatives or college students into internships or um, um, full green jobs that are in climate technology, climate policy work, um, climate creative work. There's just a plethora of different careers that are now emerging. And I really feel that, that the intersection between technology, data, and environments are coming together to produce that. And also, I, I, I challenge a lot of young people is like, look into sustainable companies. You don't want to work for a nonprofit. I think a lot of us wouldn't want to work for a nonprofit or someone. Why don't you look at companies that produce like a sustainability, like Apple, for example, they have a sustainability team or look at your favorite products. Hey, I use this detergent. Is there an eco-friendly brand that exists out there? Oh, do they have internships? Let me look at that. Oh, my beauty brand um, is there. I want to be able to use it. You know, those are all things um, that I feel like you're able to really experiment with. And also like, you know, I, I always say this too. It's like, it is hard your first job and it is really a lot of pressure that you all have right now your generation specifically because you're right now in a pandemic you're in um, an economic recession a lot of things are hard on you all and i, I just want to validate that that when i graduated in 2018 that was a different landscape than what you were all graduating in but that's not to say that you know environment have to sometimes take those jobs because their parents are in the hospital their sibling is sick I had to work three jobs and I remember like almost burning myself out because I didn't have enough money to pay rent and then yet had to perform to do school and yet still having to handle family health related issues. That was a lot of, a lot of stress on me. And I, and I think we, we shouldn't be living that way. I agree. It's not your fault, but I also think, you know, hopefully a lot of us can help redesign each other's careers, which is why I always, say mentorship is the strongest place for you to get to your next career. Now, the last person, that question from the last person was modified a little bit, and I'm going to add this in case there's any more you'd like to say on that. Um, how do I get Latinx students interested in environmental issues when it's not something they see as a fundamental issue to their well-being? I, you know, if you're engaging with community-led programs, I always say, 
let's let's break it down per sector right how is it the fact that in latin communities we can make funny memes about you know the piñata we can make funny memes about hot cheetos we can make funny memes about the wooden spoon um whether you got beat by it or you used it to cook like we can make all we can make things comedic but we can also make things educational so for me what i have done usually is when i go to immigrant spaces and they sometimes say oh environmentalism is a white thing i'm like no it's not because we are the environment people species themselves as a living organism are part of the environment so for me, I always try to really um, approach interrogation, I mean, education with love, not interrogation, because education kind of gives you a tool. So in the food sector, challenge your students to pick local food in their area for people that don't understand the value of fashion, of how much it costs to make a shirt, teach them and then make that component of like, did you know it's people that look like you that are making our clothes? Is that really what we want to build in a society? Or is that something that we want to redesign and rethink and to collapse those, those systems of oppression? I think for me, like really putting myself like at a young age, my father throwing me to like, you know, work at such a young age, I recognize the value of exploitation and what I don't want to see in my world, what I don't want to see with who I employ in my company. I feel that a lot of people sometimes um, not people, but I think with young Latin environmentalists that were inspiring the next generation is that we have to really show up for them. We have to be there because I remember at college looking up to other people and I would go up to them and they'd be like, no, I don't talk to young people. And it's like, well, who am I supposed to look at? And now that so many Latin environments look up to me, it's like, I have that duty now and responsibility to give back to them because I don't want them to feel the same way that I had to go through. And um, there's different ways to do it through media, entertainment, cult, pop culture. Um, tag your favorite, um, you know, Peso Bloom. Tag your favorite, like Bad Bunny, your favorite artist out there and be like, talk about climate. Like there's so many intersections out there. And I feel that it's not about you having to talk about this granular science or say, did you know that, you know, exoplanet emissions are polluted? Just talk about your friends. Be like, what do you think about the environment? Do you believe in climate change? Um, those are the really the the coffee conversation that you need to start having ASAP. But also like for those who are ready to take action is just to be like, what is it that they love? Do they love like, do they love drawing? Do they love all these things? Like there's different messages that can go across. And I think it's really depending on the individuals themselves, but definitely on hands workshops and events have always given me that hope to be like, this is why I'm doing this work. That's such great suggestions. I really, really appreciate that is it is. And here's another good question. How do you suggest voters in red states advocate for environmental policy change when the political majority is largely opposed to recognizing climate change? So with red states specifically, um, I think, you know, one thing to know is to engage with a lot of conservative communities and sometimes um, they are Latin is to really get them to agree through a different lens um i know they're not they're not a latin org but there's a really interesting organization called conservatives for climate and it's run by um a person that's my age younger generations of people from different races and they work together with conservatives to really push the dial around climate change um i know that you know my beliefs on you know like conservatives are different but I know that there's a large percentage of Republican voters that are young that want their candidate to talk about climate change. So I think that for a lot of people like, and I'm not asking you all to go talk to someone who's like for Trump. I'm asking you all to like, you know, understand to be comfortable that there are definitely people that don't agree with, they, they agree with climate change, but they don't agree with the way that we should go about it. If you're able to get to that conversation where they can agree to climate change, you're more often to know that they're willing to really educate and inspire others to start talking about it. So I, I really think that that's one of the hardest things, but also for a, a lot of um, candidates, I know Gen Z for Change is a really great um, organizing organization where they're getting, um, they're endorsing a lot of Gen Z candidates or working with Gen Z candidates to get them to the next level of their political form. Because if we're able to really flip those areas into blue areas, um, the more progress that will actually come. So. I always tell people that, yes, local elections matter. Yes, they're very frustrating. Yes, for rural areas, 
it almost seems that you have to really um, expose yourself to a point of exploitation, um, which is not okay, but also making sure that it's not about, you know, asking, do you believe climate change? It's do you understand climate change? Because assuming that people are believing in the climate change is already putting it on a belief system like religion. Do you believe in Jesus? Like, do you believe in climate change? That's giving them the option to think the alternative. And so let's actually switch and better reframe ourselves to ask better questions of, do you understand what a greenhouse gas emission is? Did you, have you experienced a climate disaster? Do you feel like the weather has changed so much since growing up? Those are the right like, better questions to start asking people Rather than, and I understand too, trying to shut them down for saying certain things that you may not agree with sometimes. So yes, in your work, are there specific environmental um, dangers that, that you, one or two that you'd like to share with us or, or a project that people could look to support progress on? For any um, young person out there, um, definitely get involved with the Youth Climate Justice Fund. They give grant opportunities um, for organizations or collectives that are working of climate justice. And they require that if you are part of America, that you have a diverse um, audience and diverse team members. Um, and the second thing is like initiatives that can be supported more is actually following the stories around migration and climate solutions. So. Um, for me, I work a lot with immigrant immigrant right groups like Partnerships for New America, where we we're talking about that um, migration, um, supporting safe migration should be a climate solution. Um, and those are things that I feel like we should be learning more about because if we don't, we're actually losing a lot of information that can be educated with others. And the last thing I would probably say is um, just in retrospect, like I think, um, I really think that um, to me, like understanding what climate, um, understanding that climate migrants really need support right now um, against the walls. I mean, we saw right now recently in Texas where they literally put metal chains and like uh, literally knives on these like growing, mach like these machines that block migrants from coming and literally pregnant women and children were getting um, like hurt by them. And Texas governor was like, we're not doing anything. They're just floating. They're just, you know, we're just protecting. And it's like, those are weapons that are being used. So the more and more that we we talk about immigrants, there's a really strong tie around climate because we know that um, cl the climate crisis is becoming worse. But also another thing I want to just share really quickly is like a lot of um, white supremacist groups really relate to this ideology of eco-fascism. And if you know, back in a few years ago, um, there's an eco-fascist student who wrote in his manifesto that went to Walmart and unalived many Latin immigrants. He had said that people of color are stealing natural resources, therefore they needed to be cleansed from the world. So as migration and as, as the immigrant or migration is becoming such a huge issue due to the climate crisis too, and of course other things, um, there are more harmful narratives that are being put out there and we need you all to step up and to really dismantle those harmful narratives around immigrants polluting the planet because it's been found immigrants in general that are poor pollute, pollute the, the way less and corporations and billionaires are the ones who are polluting the most. So those are the things that we need to watch out for. I wanted to say that uh, I really appreciate your presenting the reality of the danger to countries across, across Latin America. Um, and mm -hmm. we as um, the big US above them need to really think more about our, our impact there. Um, are there any governments across um, Latin America that you would like to share um, projects that they have to protect the environment, or 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 are do they not exist? <laughs> um, they do exist. I don't have them on top of my head, but I would say follow um, the upcoming COP twenty eight, which is the conference of parties twenty eight that brings um, governments, corporations foundations together um, for a climate conference to discuss the climate policies that are happening. One of the major things that many Latin American countries are asking for is um, climate adaptations or mitigation funds. So they're asking countries like the UK, Canada, America to give them money um, because they plundered their ecosystems. 
And those are kind of conversations that are happening um, on that end. So follow United Nations on that end to learn more. I mean, it's not, I think there's a lot of developments that are happening um, in the movement. You have, like I said earlier, you have really um, thrown out so much information. Um, I would think you might be a little bit exhausted <laughs> yourself <laughs> from the presentation because it's been so powerful. So I wanna thank you very much and um, is I th at this point, if you have a final message that you'd like to share with the audience? I think like if you want to get involved, follow me at Queer Brown Vegan. Um, I'm doing a lot of environmental media work today um, and I'm really highlighting Climate Week New York City here um, that I'm at right now just to like explore climate topics. But um, please just uh, hopefully you all get inspired to start talking more about environmentalism and how it relates to your community too. We are very thankful for the time that you gave us today. I know that when we talked earlier, say as I said, I was so excited about someone who's building a career that can talk to us because so often we have um, some of our presenters are closer to the end of their careers. And it's really been great to have a youthful person with energy to tell us about what you're doing. Um, we're very, very thankful for your being with us. We will follow you. Um, and I will send some information out to the audience members based on uh, some of the organizations and websites that you shared today. So uh, Joe, I, I can you, there we go. So there's an online evaluation there. Um, I will send that out in an email. I'm sorry, I did not get it in the chat, but we so appreciate you're giving us feedback. And if you complete that evaluation, it helps you to qualify for recognition um, at the end of this 2023 year. I would like to share with you, it's a very, very busy time at Metro. We have a lot going on in the next two weeks. On Thursday, the sacred tradition of the sweat lodge will be presented by Chris Eaglehawk, who's Oblala Lakota. Um, this is an in-person event, but it's also available to you if you can't attend via Zoom, and I will send that out also in the emails that will go out following today's event. Um, that's part of our Diversity Matters lecture series, but it is also um, one of our promotions that we present before our powwow. On Friday at 11 a.m. at the Elkhorn Valley campus, this will be in-person only, but we do every year before a live powwow, we do a powwow preview. It will be in the Elkhorn Valley Campus Commons. And um, again, Mr. Chris Eaglehawk will be there. A few members from the Rock Bear Host Southern Drum will be singing and we'll have some local dancers. So it's just a taste, um, but that opportunity to hear from Mr. Eaglehawk, who is a renowned MC from the Denver powwow, which is a really huge powwow, and um, he's a cultural consultant. He'll be able to help you understand some of the factors involved in powwow dancing and music. So now we'll go on. There's our powwow this Saturday from 1 to 7.30. Many of you know uh, this is the 32nd annual, and the last three years we were doing things virtually because of the pandemic, so we're super excited to see people in person. But we're also very thankful to our technical staff who have suggested and are prepared to present a Zoom option for anybody who cannot attend in person. So that will be this Saturday. And then next week, we continue Hispanic Latino Heritage Month programming. We will be watching a film. This will be all virtual. Called uh, The film is called Missing in Brooks County. We're delighted that Mr. Eduardo Canales from the South Texas Human Rights Center will discuss with us following uh, that documentary. Once again, I want to thank everybody for being with us for this first program. Uh, we have lots of thanks coming in uh, in the chat. Zayas, again, it was a pleasure to have you with us. And um, thank you also to the technical staff that make this possible. Everybody have a good afternoon. Take care.